We've got four panelists this afternoon, and we're going to talk about immigration and skills training. What kind of skills do we need uh, in rural areas in order to make the, those regions sustainable? Um, so we've got the fourth industrial revolution is upon us. So you remember the first industrial revolution from around 1750 to 1850 or so. That's when the steam engine came in, manufacturing of textiles and all of that. Then we had the second industrial revolution that had the internal combustion engine, it had uh, electricity, it had uh, you know all of these kinds of things that went till about 1914. And then we had the third industrial rev revolution uh, that uh, happened around the time compu computers came around, 1980s or so, personal computers. That's when the third industrial revolution came around and we had IT systems and uh, corporations and, and all of that. We're now in, people are saying we're in the fourth industrial re revolution now. And of course, revolutions disrupt. Revolutions take the people who are in power and replace them with other people who are in power. It's very disruptive. That's what's happening now. So the fourth industrial re revolution has to do with 3D printing, robotics, artificial intelligence, um, what else? Uh, biotechnology, the Internet of Things, etc. We're going through a period now where, I like to think of it this way, that the economy that our parents, my parents knew, my children will know a totally, or my grandchildren will know a totally different economy than what came before. That's the, that's the nature of the change that's happening now. How is that going to impact rural areas? How is that going to impact the activities that take place in rural areas? Just because you're in rural does not mean that you are exempt from all of that. Uh, remember, uh, Jillian this morning spoke about uh, putting cell towers in, in uh, the Labrador Straits area. Well, the, you've got the technology there now. It's chasing after you. You've got to be able to use it. Otherwise, you're going to be left behind. Even places like Africa are kind of leapfrogging uh, our technology. Here in North America and Europe, we, we dug telephone lines in the ground and, and uh, strung wires from pole to pole. Africa missed all of that, but now they're going cellular. And so it doesn't matter if you're rural or, or urban, things are going to change. So that's what we need to talk about today. And uh, so we're going to start with the panel. Uh, we've got four people on the panel today, this afternoon. I'm going to introduce them. Uh, and we have one online as well. Welcome, Arthur. Uh, pleased to have you with us. Um, so I'm going to introduce the panelists in the order in which they'll be speaking. I'll introduce them all at once to save time. Uh, George Lee began his career as a teacher before becoming director of extension service at Memorial University. In 1983, he moved to the private sector where he worked on the development and implementation of a project to deliver Canada's fish processing technology through Canada's ASEAN project, a 15-year project implemented in collaboration with Japan that included a range of Asian countries. In 1995, he hosted the first ever trade mission from China to Newfoundland Labrador. George continued his work in China and brought the first small group of immigrants to Newfoundland Labrador, as well as the first Chinese students to Mun and CNA. His work helped justify a trip to Newfoundland Labrador by, by the Premier of China at the time, Zhu Ranji, in the late 1990s. George continues to work for open access and cooperation between China and Newfoundland Labrador companies, focusing on new and emerging provincial immigration programs. Uh, at present, uh, George is the owner slash president of New Land Canada Futures with its mission to encourage foreign investment from China and other Asian countries in partnership with local export-ready private companies. So we're pleased to have George here with us today. Arthur Akberi is professor who you see on the screen, is professor of economics at St. Mary's University and chair of that university's Atlantic Group on Economics of Immigration, Aging, and Diversity at the Sobe School of Business Economics. He obtained his PhD from Simon Fraser University in 1988 and has frequently served as a visiting scholar at various universities. His research interests are labor economics, including immigration and education, and health economics. Delia Warren, in front here, is the director of Iron and Earth East, a not-for-profit organization led by oil sands workers committed to incorporating more renewable energy projects. 
Delia has always been concerned by the adverse impacts of human activity on the environment and recognizes that the transition to renewable energy is creating vast opportunities for job creation and economic development, as well as a sustainable future for our planet and its people. Graduating from Memorial University in 2009 with a degree in mechanical engineering, Delia spent seven years working in the offshore oil and gas industry in Scotland, France, and here at home in St. John's, before becoming director of Iron and Earth East in 2016. She's currently project coordinator for, for Iron and Earth East's 365 greenhouse project and is completing an MBA at Memorial University. And Sarah Thompson, who will also be joining us online, is a project coordinator at the Association for New Canadians and the project lead for Bridging the Divide, Connecting and Preparing Refugees for the Province's Agriculture Industry, which is funded by, workforce innovation, by the Workforce Innovation Centre. Prior to undertaking this project, Ms. Thompson worked with the Language Training Centre at the ANC, providing one-on-one -on -one employment counselling as well as workplace ESL classes to prepare newcomers for the Canadian workplace. In her role with Bridging the Divide, Sarah discovered a shared, untapped employ employability skill that exists among many newcomers. They were all farmers. This project marries two of Sarah's desires for this province, food security and a culturally and economically richer province to live in through diversity. So you'll agree with me that we have four great presenters, and I'd like to welcome uh, George Lee as the first presenter. Over to you, George. <laughs> Mike is a little bit taller than I am. Um, first of all, I'd like to make a correction in the uh, program. I'm not representing the Shore Pass Foundation from Fogo Island, uh, but I have a long history of involvement with Fogo Island. But I take full blame for this uh, slight, not very important um, uh, correction because I've been traveling outside of the country. And I lost contact with the people who were doing the final arrangements. So uh, there's no big uh, deal there. <clears throat> I am going to talk today about uh, a specific program or a specific proposal to integrate immigration with the fishing sector in the province. Uh, this. Uh, just to give you a little bit of a background, uh, last year we did a two-day conference on Fogo Island, and the conference was intending to recognize uh, the 50th anniversary of the formation of the Fogo Island Co-op and the 50th anniversary of the Fogo process. And so the first day we talked about how it was formed and what the Fogo Co-op has... Uh, uh, has, has succeeded in doing. And then for the second day, we talked about two issues that they have to look at for the future, for the next 50 years. And basically, we, dry, we tried to draw a connection between what happened on Fogo in the last 50 years and what lessons can be learned for rural Newfoundland for the next 50 years. And the two issues we concentrated on in the second day was immigration. Immigration in rural Newfoundland in particular has to be looked very seriously at by us and we're starting today. I also would like to say that um, Dr. Tony Fang uh, was present for the conference on FOGO. And uh, we also had in, uh, an investor group from China. So we had a good discussion about the sustainability that can be achieved by the integration, the connections between immigration and fisheries, the fishery sector in specific, specifically. So after that conference, the manager of the Fogo Co-op, who was supposed to be here doing the presentation with me today, unfortunately has a family problem and couldn't make it, but he and I were invited to a session at the province where the province was discussing the newly introduced 
Atlantic pilot project, whereby if an immigrant came to work for one year, they could obtain their Canadian citizenship. And that's a program that's running throughout all the other provinces. So when we had the explanation as to what it entailed, it really meant that the receiving company in Newfoundland had to guarantee 12 months work. Now, in rural Newfoundland mostly, you know the problem with that. The fish companies cannot guarantee 12 months work. Maximum in a place like Fogo is seven months. On the other hand, the major problem in these small fish plants and in all the fish plants throughout our province is that we can't get workers anymore. We have to do something about the problem, okay? The current solution is the uh, temporary foreign worker. In our opinion, the temporary foreign worker will not work because if we intend to do something that is helpful to rural Newfoundland in terms of building the population, these people are here six weeks, seven weeks, and then they're gone. And it's not gonna help. So we went to the people after the session and we said, what about if we consider combining the work term that the fish plant can offer with an internship? So we would, for example, have seven months of work, and we're thinking specifically about Fogo as a kind of a pilot project for this, for this submission. And they would work for seven, seven months, and then we would have an internship for five months. And of course, under the immigration uh, legislation, the definition of work includes internship. So it's all work. So basically, we had follow-up meetings both with the provincial and the federal authorities, and it looks like they like the idea. We don't have a final answer. But we're hoping, uh, when the minister makes the announcement about the entrepreneur category, which he's promised to do in the next couple of weeks, that all of the things you know, that they're working on in the province will come together, including, we hope, the approval of, of this idea. And just to expand on the idea a little bit, uh, we also made contact with the Marine Institute. The Marine Institute, as you know, is responsible for the training of uh, fishing processing people. And they responded quite positively. So we will be working with the Marine Institute to develop this internship period. <coughs> Most of the internship would be prior to their going to work in the fish plant. But some of it could be at the end and we're also thinking about the possibility that some of the internship could, hap could happen in the country where the immigrant is coming from, okay? So uh, in addition to approaching the Marine Institute, we also approached the uh, Association for New Canadians. And uh, I personally am very pleased with the recent uh, development of regional offices for the Association for New Canadians. So in the process of building this project, we have linked the FOGO process, of course, with the Grand Falls office of the Association for New Canadians, and we will be working with them, plus the Marine Institute, to develop this internship. Uh, in terms of I concentrate mostly on, um, on China, but on the Asia region generally, particularly the ASEAN countries. And um, just thinking about China, uh, you probably heard because it was public knowledge that back in the 90s, the province signed a memorandum of understanding with one of the provinces in China. Uh, the Zhejiang province, which is just south of Shanghai. 
And I happened to be working uh, prior to that for quite some time in one of the largest fishing ports in China, Zhoushan City. And at that time, I worked very closely with the Marine Institute, having a background in, of course, the university and rural development, working with fisher people and that kind of thing. So uh, some of the professors from the Marine Institute at that time uh, went to Zhoushan City when they were starting the Ocean University of Zhoushan City. And they spent some time there doing courses and talking about their work here and so on and so forth. So that was part of the reason why the province signed this MOU with, with Zhoujiang province. So now if we extend that, and if, for example, we work with the Ocean University of Zhoushan City, we could probably do one or two months of the internship right there in China. And we could, and, and then we would do some skills upgrading at the Marine Institute when they come. But we also want the internship to concentrate on, uh, on, on ideas of settlement and therefore to work closely with the community. Now don't forget that these workers will be coming with their families, okay? The pilot project allows for that to happen. So therefore we have to work in some training at the community level whereby we integrate those families with the families on Fogo Island and so on and so forth. And the other thing we've done, we've contacted the uh, town council and the town council were quite interested to the point that they said they would in fact allocate land for these incoming immigrants who could build homes and so on and so forth. Now all of this is, is speculative. None of this is done for sure. But that, that's a project we're working on, which I think is a good example of how we can, immig how we can integrate immigration with our local industry. And there's no question in the world, but the best industry to start with is fishing, because the fishing is the heart of our communities. So we will be working with fish companies in addition to the Fogo Co-op. So basically, and in a very simple nutshell, that's what we're up to. And what I do basically now is to, my company is called Newland Canada Futures. I sell futures. I sell Newfoundland as a place to live for the future, for immigrants to come and make a future, and to live here and to help us grow our population. Because we have... I mean, as a Newfoundlander, I worry, I, I lose sleep. I should be sleeping easily at my age. But I stay awake in the nighttime worrying what we're going to do because we don't have enough people. How are we going to live here if we don't have people? We got to get people, people, people. And every immigrant I see, every foreigner I see, I feel like kissing them in the supermarket <laughs> because they're here. Because it's so important is so important for us to look at the whole world, the whole world, and say, you're welcome to come to Newfoundland. We have the, you know, we have the best place in the world. What, what's the problem? Where are you? Now, I know what the problem are, problems are, and you all know what the problems are. But I congratulate the government. The government is beginning to get on the right track. This particular government has been cautious in their moves, but I think that's wise, but I think also we're at the point now where we're ready to move. I mean, this uh, entrepreneur category I've been waiting for for 20 years. I mean, I was trying to get something like this in the late 1990s. And I must say, you know, the governments at that time were doing some things, including the, 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 the MOU with Zhejiang province and so on and so forth. But then all of a sudden it came to an end. And I can understand that and were, we had other problems uh, financially and so on and so forth. But now it seems to me we're back on track and I'm really looking forward to the final announcement when we can bring investors because it's not just a matter of bringing in skills. We have to bring in money. We have to bring in people who are experts 
at making money, of running businesses, and no one in the world is more successful at doing that than the Chinese people. And when we bring them in, I'll give you another example before I stop. Tell me, Mike, uh, have I got any more time? One minute. One minute. Okay. We can bring people in who have money and who have expertise in developing entrepreneurship. And my uh, philosophy is that we have to link them to local entrepreneurs and let them work together and integrate the industries together. Because you can't bring someone to the Codroy Valley and give them 100 acres of land and think that it's going to work. It's just not going to work. There are other examples I can give you later during the discussion. But that's our project. Very much, George. Uh, Arthur, are you there? Thank you, Mike, and uh, I thank the organizers for having me do this uh, presentation. Uh, also, as a co-host of the conference, I also welcome you on behalf of Atlantic Research Group to this conference, and thank you, Tony Fang, for and his team for organizing it. Uh, it was really nice to hear George um, speak on the excellent initiatives uh, being adopted in. Newfoundland and Labrador to attract immigrants. Uh, my presentation is uh, a little different from uh, others in the sense that it is presented by an acad academician, uh, so it's going to be more general. Uh, I'm going to provide some data and some, uh, um, some policy recommendations. So my presentation is organized in the following way. First, I will look at the sources of uh, uh, economic uh, growth in a region, and then I will look at provide some demographic data for Atlantic Canada and forecasts of job opportunities uh, in Atlantic Canada and the importance of immigration there. Then I will look at the impact of training and how it can help uh, immigrants. And finally, I will present a recommendation slide. Okay. So um, in economic literature, there are uh, different sources of long-term economic growth. The major ones are accumulation of uh, capital stock, by which we mean accumulation of plant and equipment, um, which leads to higher production and higher economic growth. Uh, then another source is uh, uh, we need um, labor input, such as workers or uh, hours worked, and the third important sources increases in productivity of labor and capital. So given the focus of this uh, conference, I'm going to uh, concentrate on the last two, increase in labor inputs and increases in productivity of labor and capital. Next slide, please. Oh. Are we on the next slide? Yes. Uh, so uh, unless you okay. hear back from me, Arthur, you can just keep going. I'll, I think I've... I've okay. got that under control. So here I have presented uh, some demographic realities for Atlantic Canada in the post-World War II period, and I'm sure most people in the room are aware of what is happening in Atlantic Canada. There is a consistent decline in birth rate uh, over the period, so much so that since 2014, the birth rates have fallen below the death rate, meaning that the natural growth of population in this region has become negative. <clears throat> what it uh, means then is that uh, if we also um, add this to um, the phenomena of uh, youth out migration from the region, then the population is uh, um, population in this region is moving towards a decline. Uh, and unless we have uh, um, some policies or initiatives to reverse this trend in birth rates and attract more immigrants, we are going to see uh, negative population growth, uh, which has its economic and political consequences. And I will not go over those here. Uh, I will move to the next slide now. I got these data from, uh, from uh, uh, Service Canada. They make them uh, they make projections of job opportunities every three years. So the last time they did was in 2016, over the period 2016 to 18. And their projections indicated that uh, in Atlantic Canada, 
the job opportunities will grow by 1.7 percent. However, most of these job opportunities will take place through attrition. And due to job growth, there will be a decline. So what this means is that uh, most job uh, opportunities that will take place will be through retirement or death, which is, which is uh, a reflection of the demographic data that we saw earlier. Next slide, please. Immigrants, um, as, a, as a result of this, uh, uh, what we see is that um, it's obvious that immigration is going to play an important role in the growth of labor force. Uh, which is true in other regions of Canada as well. However, uh, this region has been receiving uh, fewer immigrants uh, compared to its uh, population. Uh, if we look, the Atlantic Canadian population is about 6% of uh, uh, Canadian population, while the immigrant intake every year is only 2 to 4%. So that explains why the region uh, regions share in um, immigrants share in regional labor force is so small compared to other regions. But we this is expected to grow given the uh, initiatives that are undertaken at community level and at government levels. Now we move to the next slide, which uh, provides the. Um, job projected job opportunities by skill level uh, for the same time period in Atlantic Canada. And uh, we note here that uh, most job opportunities um, are going to uh, take place from uh, management to intermediate uh, level. And at the laboring, laboring level or the labor type of jobs, uh, their growth will be smaller than the, the top uh, ISCA levels. And then because uh, the, uh, and then the, uh, the same slide also tells us uh, what will be the job growth attributable to attrition. And again, it shows that 71,000 jobs will be, will be created due to attrition, due to retirement and death. <clears throat> and, uh, uh, the, the, negative, uh, the negative number due to growth, uh, it's probably a reflection of the fact that many uh, large-scale capital projects are winding up, uh, which is leading to slowing down of growth. Then because uh, in this conference we have also talked about the, um, we have also talked about the uh, um, rural uh, immigration, so I thought I will also have another slide on natural resource industries, uh, projected employment in natural resource industries, because most of them are um, in, in rural uh, parts of the, of the region. And this shows here that uh, in, if you look at the natural resource industries, then uh, most jobs are likely to be created in management and professional positions. Um, and at the lower levels, there will be there will be negative growth. Now, the top management, management and professional positions are the ones which also require a higher education. And um, all the research indicate that um, there is greater mobility among people who have uh, acquired higher education. So that has some implication on, on retention. <clears throat> So we move on to the next slide from here. I know my time is uh, about to finish. So um, because this session is on uh, skills training, so um, this is another source of uh, economic growth. So we talked about the uh, source due to uh, numbers of workers. And now we are looking at the uh, source of economic growth due to productivity. Uh, and we are looking at the productivity of workers. There are different types of skills training, um, formal classroom training and informal one. Uh, and the informal um, training is the same as on the job training, which accounts for more than half of lifetime human capital. Um, the informal training could be of general type or a specific type. 
By general training, what we mean is that the skills that people acquire during general training, uh, are, those skills are marketable everywhere in the industry. So the employer does not have as much uh, incentive to provide general training because the worker after acquiring the training could leave and work somewhere else. So in this case, uh, there is room for government to, to step in and provide that type of training. The specific training is more firm specific, whereby the skills that the workers acquire are good only for the firm and not elsewhere in the, in the industry. So in this case, then firms can expect to retain the workers by increasing most training has got general and specific component in it. So in order to, if, if firms are uh, worried about retaining new workers, say immigrant workers, then if they increase the component of uh, specific training, uh, for example, involve them more in decision making, uh, uh, in, uh, in other sorts of things where workers feel uh, associated with the firm, then that is going to increase their retention. And it will also help increase retention in the region. The impact of training is, uh, as I already mentioned, on worker productivity. Uh, so after the training, we have a productive workforce, and it also helps increase uh, wages. Most studies have shown that uh, people who have acquired more training tend to earn higher earnings. Then we move to the next slide from here, which whereby I have looked at impacts of training for immigrants. Um, training provides uh, better access to uh, labor market for immigrants by increasing their employment opportunities, uh, increasing their earnings, which reduces their dependence on welfare, and also helps increase returns to foreign education and training, which has been a problem in all regions of Canada. So by providing them a, a tra more training, we indirectly also increase their returns to foreign education and training. And it also helps increase their social interaction within the organization as well as outside the organization because of um, improvement in their, in their well-being. My next slide is on challenges of uh, skill training in rural areas because we are focusing more on rural areas in this uh, conference. Um, <clears throat> one challenge that uh, we have in rural areas is uh, that high training costs, there are high training costs because of poor economies of scale. Our population is widely scattered in rural areas, uh, which uh, increases the, the cost of training to the training providers. There's also a lack of public transportation, making it difficult for trainees to access training. Um, availability of technological support, uh, availability of internet, for example, is, there is a lack of that. And also, it's hard to attract young population, uh, which creates a problem because young population is more adaptive to learning new skills and new trade, new trades. So we have to do something to, to make it uh, more attractive for them. And now I'm on my last slide here uh, <clears throat> uh, to give some policy recommendations based on my presentation. Uh, so one thing that we have seen is that uh, most jobs in Atlantic Canada will be open through attrition, uh, which means that uh, more attraction and retention of immigrants is needed, and Atlantic Immigration Pilot is uh, uh, is uh, one experiment that is being done in this regard, and uh, initial results indicate that there is a lot of success in all provinces in this regard. Um, recognize the opportunities presented by seniors in population. Last year we did a uh, workshop, we did a conference in all four provinces, including Newfoundland and Labrador, where we looked at what uh, opportunities does the population of seniors uh, present um, in the in the labor force. Seniors can provide uh, mentorship, leadership, network opportunities, which can help increase the productivity of younger workers. So the, we should identify the opportunities that seniors present and exploit those opportunities. Retaining workers reaching retirement age is also another um, solution. Address barriers for labor force participation of underrepresented groups, including 
people with disabilities, people who are visible minorities, women, new immigrants, etc. Addressing challenges of skills training, we talked about that, especially in relation to rural Canada. And then, as I mentioned before, if you increase the firm-specific component of training for immigrants by making by increasing their association with the organization, um, that will also help. And finally, I think that we are still lacking uh, enough data at regional or provincial level to have clear understanding of uh, regional market issues. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Arthur. Uh, and uh, hopefully you'll stay on the line and be around to answer questions at the end. Sure. And Thank we you. turn over to Delia. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much to the organizers for uh, inviting me here to, to speak with you on behalf of uh, Iron and Earth and Iron and Earth East, the local chapter. Uh, my name is Delia Warren, and uh, our organization doesn't focus so much on the immigration side of, uh, of the topics that we've discussed today, but we certainly are uh, in the sustainability and the sustainable development landscape. Um, so I'm just going to give you all a brief introduction of who Iron and Earth is as an organization, um, the kind of things that we do with the community, and, and then maybe uh, talk about how um, our role is relevant to what we've been di discussing today. So Iron and Earth is a nonprofit organization. We were started in Alberta uh, following the oil price downturn in uh, 2014 when our founder, a boilermaker in the oil sands, was noticing that the conversations that uh, his colleagues were having around the lunchroom table were turning towards uh, what, are, what are our futures going to look like? Uh, a lot of layoffs were happening. They were noticing um, an increased focus on climate change issues, obviously the impacts of, uh, the, on the environment by acts such as um, extraction of oil from the, the oil sands was, is, was front and center for a lot of them. And they recognized primarily that they had very valuable skills that could be applied outside of the oil and gas industry. So in parallel with that, with some of the issues that we've seen in the oil and gas industry in the last number of years uh, and the you know, oil price crashes, that kind of thing, um, in parallel with that, there has been an increased focus on renewable energy development, decarbonizing the economy, electrifying the economy, and basically making overall changes to society in the name of climate change. So um, while one industry seems to be struggling a little bit, and I know in Newfoundland and Labrador, um, we do still have a very strong focus on that industry. Um, it is an industry that has a, a certain amount of volatility built in, unpredictable oil prices, the future is kind of up in the air, and we do know that in order to avoid the worst impacts of climate change, we need to decarbonize. So Iron and Earth was born from the idea that as one industry is uh, transitioning uh, probably into a position of less prominence, now is the time to grow the renewable energy industry and the skills from one can be often directly employed in the other. And where there are gaps, there's a role for training. And so that's where our organization basically was born. Newfoundland and Labrador's chapter, uh, Iron and Earth East, so far we're the, the only chapter east of Alberta. Uh, we have a lot of similar challenges. We have an offshore oil and gas industry. A lot of our people are employed in that industry or um, industries that depend on that. And a lot of our workers also travel back and forth to Alberta for work. So when the oil industry is suffering, we feel that very uh, deeply in Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, our economy is very tied to that. And we have a very strong network of skilled tradespeople. So in Newfoundland and Labrador, we don't really have much of a renewable industry, renewable energy industry, other than large scale hydro to transition our very um, skilled trades workers into. So we've kind of taken more of an educational role in Newfoundland and Labrador, uh, raising issues and awareness about renewable energy, about the immense renewable energy resources that we uh, possess as a province, the opportunities within those industries to grow economically, to create jobs, to create opportunities for people from the oil and gas industry and supporting industries. And basically that's where we are. So what we do as an organization, and specifically as Iron and Earth East, we promote renewable energy, we create networking and training opportunities. Um, 
We advise government and policy organizations on policy regarding skills training, uh, transition um, programs for workers and for industries, and then again, like I mentioned, public, public education and awareness. So one of the first pieces of work that we put together was the Workers' Climate Plan, and this was basically a project that came out of Iron and Earth uh, National. We did some surveys with members of the um, oil and gas industry, people that work in the industry or are involved in some way, have family members, basically gauged what their opinions were on the transition. Would you work in the renewable energy industry? Do you have skills? Uh, do you need new skills? Would you be willing to take a pay cut to make that transition? Those types of questions. And from that came a policy document called the Workers' Climate Plan. Um, and it had three main recommendations upskilling energy sector workers, so that's really finding those skill gaps and determining what short-term uh, training programs you could use to fill those gaps, positioning any energy sector stakeholders in a renewable energy or a, a cleaner uh, energy environment, so that's, you know, looking at supply chains, seeing what companies could serve parallel roles, that kind of thing, looking at supporting industries. And then third, integrating renewable energy technologies into non-renewable energy infrastructure. So a lot of industrial operations generate a lot of emissions. There are opportunities to reduce those emissions by integrating cleaner technology products. So not necessarily renewable energy, but other innovations focusing on efficiency and uh, cleaner operations. So that was our big policy document, kind of uh, what gave us our direction. Uh, but in Newfoundland and Labrador, we focus much more locally. So in the last couple of years, we've really been traveling around the province and giving presentations in what we call our speaker series. So the focus of this is addressing misinformation regarding uh, renewable energy in the province. So this gentleman here is Nick Mercer. He works really closely with us. And uh, sorry if you can't see the, the bottom there. Basically, he did a big study on renewable energy, in particular wind energy in Newfoundland and Labrador. We all know it's super duper windy here, but we don't have very much wind energy, so he looked to see why that was. And he identified a number of barriers. He's got a really great paper on the subject. Um, but some of the primary barriers that he addressed, other than you know a mega project mentality and those types of things, was Misunder misinformation and lack of awareness in the public. So if the public don't understand a technology or, or aren't aware of its benefits, they're not going to push their government to really pursue those technologies. So we said, okay, we're gonna go out there and break down those, uh, those barriers by addressing misinformation. So wind energy is a viable option. It's not too windy in Newfoundland. Um, the wind isn't too gusty and cats kill way more birds than uh, wind turbines, so that kind of thing. So we toured the, the province. We also did shop talks. So uh, shop talks were geared more so towards trades workers and the general public, letting people know about training programs that are available, like the wind turbine technician program, wind turbine technician being one of the fastest growing jobs in North America right now. Um, We'll talk a little bit more about that later. So yeah, we just wanted to get people aware, get people talking about this. I've got some really great pamphlets on uh, wind energy in Newfoundland if anybody's interested in uh, picking one of those up before you leave. Our biggest project, uh, and one that I'm very, very proud to be a part of, is the 365 Greenhouse. So a partnership grew out of Iron and Earth East that nobody really predicted, and that was in working with the Autism Society of Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, we discussed net metering a little bit earlier. I'm not sure if that was just in our, in our little group, but net metering is a, a program that was introduced to Newfoundland and Labrador in 2017, whereby we're finally allowed to put uh, small-scale solar or wind in our own backyards or on our roofs and generate our own power, connect to the provincial utility grid, and basically um, you pay for the, the difference between what you generate and what you use. So net metering is used right across Canada. We were the last province to have a net metering program. So a lot of people haven't heard about it. Um, we wanted to have a project that would showcase the net metering program, let people know what is possible when you use, you know, natural resources like renewable energy in an efficient and innovative way. So this project is to be our year-round greenhouse powered by renewable energy technology. So as Iron and Earth isn't really in the, the greenhouse business, we just wanted a demonstration project. We partnered with the Autism Society because they have a very special social enterprise that they call Good Roots Gardening. So they've got a greenhouse on site. 
They use the greenhouse and the gardens that are at their, their site just over there on Clinch Crescent to give people with autism spectrum disorder job training, life skills training, community integration through gardening and growing. That also works perfectly in conjunction with the pantry, which is their on-site restaurant that uses a lot of the products that they grow in their gardens to generate income for their operations. And the Autism Society is an excellent community organization. They're always looking for more funding because they have wait lists for almost every program that they offer. So through a partnership with the Autism Society, we decided they would be the beneficiaries of this greenhouse project. Growing vegetables year round in a permanent structure, a net zero building, meaning that it uses only as much energy as it produces through solar panels. So we've already installed three kilowatts of solar. I'll talk about that a little bit later. When the structure is complete, we'll install the final six kilowatts. We've got a contractor selected and construction is going to uh, begin in the spring. And basically, this is going to allow the Autism Society to generate more revenue for their operations on an ongoing basis. They're going to be able to expand the programming for the Good Roots Gardening Initiative. And it's just an all-around great example of how various initiatives can be pulled together for the overall benefit of the community. So we're really, really proud of this. And uh, we invite everybody to come have a look uh, when we do our grand opening, hopefully uh, by August of this year. So through the 365 Greenhouse and as part of a larger nationwide initiative, uh, we were able to train people in Newfoundland and Labrador to install solar uh, at the household level. So Solar Skills is a program that we developed nationally as well through Iron and Earth with the goal to train 1,000 workers, primarily from oil and gas and indigenous communities, to install uh, solar either on houses, on businesses, uh, maybe some small st scale utility solar, but basically just to bring people into this industry, to, to bring the labor skill up. And in Newfoundland and Labrador, this was a real issue because we introduced this net metering legislation, but nobody in the province had ever done an at-home grid-tied solar installation. So through the solar skills campaign, in Newfoundland and Labrador, we weren't so specific. We took any electrician that wanted to learn, not just those that had backgrounds in oil and gas, because we really want to grow the industry overall. And we've done two solar skills training campaigns. So this was our first one. I think there were 17 people in that group. Uh, that was in October of last year. And then we did another one in August of this year. And as part of this training program, it's a five-day CSA certified program, five days, and you have a brand new skill. This is the type of upskilling we're talking about, short-term training programs. We were able to uh, get this solar installed at the Autism Society right here. So that's three kilowatts of solar, um, all done through volunteer labor. And it was great because it gave our traine trainees an opportunity to get hands-on um, experience in doing these programs or doing these installations sorry so the plan is call these guys back when we get the greenhouse built they've all committed to to doing it getting getting more experience doing the installation and just helping uh, our organization and the autism society a nonprofit organization and a charity to to build a project together so we do lots of other things we've worked very closely with nia again on the policy side talking about skills training talking about opportunities um, that are going to be created through a transition, through um, decarbonization, uh, and really looking at it as an opportunity, not something to be afraid of. Um, we've done some fundraisers with local um, businesses, uh, Jack Axes, Kitty Vitty Brewery, Mallard Cottage. Um, we took part in the International Labor Organization's Academy on uh, Social and Solidarity Economy, talking about the future of work. And this is something that is really, um, really important to look at because the overall nature of work is changing. Um, and not just from people going from the oil industry into clean tech industries, but in general, automation, AI, the nature of work is changing. And it's really important to look at um, the bigger picture when it comes to skills and upskilling because there are there is going to be labor shortages in some industries and basically work shortages in a lot of other non-skilled industries, laborers, that kind of thing. A lot of jobs just aren't going to exist anymore. So 
Iron and Earth, as an organization, we look at skill building, but also trying to look at doing things efficiently and through having programs that basically map out where jobs are and how to make use of skills that already exist. So um, I guess in that vein, um, we can kind of leave it to the, the discussion and see what, what comes out of that. Um, but thank you all very much for your, your attention. And uh, yeah, I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Delia. Uh, now, do we have Sarah on the line? Okay, are people able to see my PowerPoint? So Sarah, we can't see your PowerPoint on the screen, so you're just gonna need to let me know when you want to change. We're not seeing it through oh. uh, blue jeans. Oh, okay, sure, as long as you can hear me. So uh, thanks very much for the invitation to participate in this uh, conference today. And I'm very excited to talk about a new initiative the Association for New Canadians has with, um, uh, in partnership with Grenfell Campus of Memorial. So the project is called Bridging the Divide. And we're trying, the, the, the aim of the project is to connect and uh, prepare refugees who are living, currently living in this province to um, the province's agriculture industry. If you could advance to the next slide, please. So the pro this project is one of eight research projects that was funded by the Newfoundland and Labrador Workforce Innovation Center in 2017. The fund uh, is established to test and share models of innovation to positively impact employability and uh, employment in the province. Next slide, please. So a little bit about the Association for New Canadians. Uh, the Association for New Canadians is a registered charity with the mandate from the federal government to provide language, career and settlement services to newcomers in the province. And our mission is to settle and integrate newcomers and to empower them with the skills, knowledge and information necessary to become independent contributing members of the community and the country. If you can advance to the next slide, please. So how does the ANC do that? How do we help people to integ integrate and become um, contributing members to our community? Well. I can tell you the people we work with all have the desire uh, to do just that. The, the people that come to this province want to be part of the province, uh, part of making this province a better place. Um, so the, the ANC serves really as a bridge. We, um, we bridge two divides, um, one divide being the clients that we work with and the other divide being the, the broader community. So first of all, what we need to do is really get to know the clients that we serve. Um, and uh, that, that allows us to learn about their unique skills and abilities, their, uh, learn about their unique um, experiences, their culture, their perspectives. And, uh, and, and this, this allows us to also um, uh, get to know also what, what challenges they, they face connecting with the community. But in order to get to know the clients, we, we do have to take time and we need a, the time because often um, language is a barrier. In, in most cases, language is a barrier. So we need to, to take the time to get to know the clients and uh, we need a, a level of curiosity, understanding that the differences that they bring also, that's what brings the um, or creates the opportunities here in the province. So once we get to know the clients, now we know what their unique offerings are to this province, we need to find a point of connection in the broader community. And in the case of this project, that point of connection is farming. So in getting to know the clients that we work with, we've learned that a, a lot of them come with farming backgrounds. They would have been farmers in their home countries. So uh, it seems like an optimum um, point of connection with the community where the province is trying to engage in um, more agricultural activity to address our, um, 
our labor shortages in the agriculture industry, as well as the uh, food security um, challenges that we face here in the province. So once we know our clients and we, we've discovered what this point of connection is in the community, we need to now make a plan. How are we going to bridge the, the divide? How are we going to bring the two sides together um, in a strong and effective way? Next slide, please. So about this project, um, the association is partnering on a collaborative uh, pilot, as I mentioned, with Grenfell Campus of Memorial. Um, the project um, is, uh, so how does the project create a strong bridge where newcomers are able to use their skills and help the agriculture industry in the province? So we've started with the research portion of the project or the situational analysis. And this is where we've interviewed with um, local farmers across the province um, to learn what their challenges are in terms of um, their labor shortages and, and access to skilled labor. And um, we've been interviewed um, the newcomers that are, are, are farming newcomers. So those who were farmers in their home country to find out what their experience um, with farming is, uh, as well as with secondary processing, because not only are we looking at farming in this project, we're also looking at um, secondary processing because that's another skill um, newcomers have in that they, they weren't necessarily only farmers, they were also developing uh, secondary products from their primary products. So often cases they were making cheese or they were making yogurt um, and other secondary processing. So we've, we've from the situational analysis, um, it's, that is what's informing the next phase of the project. So that's the training phase where we're going to um, um, tra train the uh, newcomers uh, in order to be prepared for the, the Newfoundland um, uh, farm environment. Um, we're also looking at training the employers in order to, um, for them to effectively receive newcomers and, and work with the diversity that will come with, um, with um, bringing newcomers into their workforce. If you could advance, oh, and sorry, no, we'll continue with this. So once the training portion of the project is, is completed, and that's going to be, um, we start the training in January and the training will go until um, March, mid-March. We're looking at then um, play, um, doing job placements. So we're aiming to have eight to 10 job placements on farms or secondary processing facilities throughout the province. Um, in the spring and summer of next year. So if you could advance to the next slide, please. So who are we working with? Um, the participants or the newcomers that um, we've identified um, for this project are in fact refugees. Um, we've discovered that a large portion of the refugees, uh, whether government assisted or privately sponsored refugees, uh, have strong farming backgrounds. It, uh, it's, it's the largest employability skill that, um, that we've been able to identify amongst uh, this group of newcomers. So the, the, the newcomers are coming from different places in the world, uh, mostly in Africa and the Middle East. Um, and we're working with newcomer, oh, sorry, refugees for a couple of reasons. One, of course, is we've identified that this is a job skill that in fact they have. But also the other reason we're working with uh, refugees in particular in this case is because they often have a harder time attaching to the labor market. So it's, it seems like an opportune opportunity to, uh, to connect them to the workforce using a skill that already exists. So when we interviewed the refugee participants for this project, we wanted to get to know um, whether or not there was in fact an interest in farming here in the province. We, we knew that they were farming in their home countries, but if they uh, had any desire to do so here in the province. Um, 
and the well i think it's fair to say they all were were very um were very interested in in farming here in the province um, and we also needed to get to know more about the skills and the experience they have with farming and with secondary production next slide please so the the refugee farmers that we've met with thus far um, have an average of 14 years of farming experience from their home countries in many cases they were subsistence farmers, but there were also a number of commercial, large-scale commercial farmers. Approximately half of the people interviewed um, worked with only hand tools and, and working animals, but the other half have experience with modern mechanized machinery such as tractors and tillers and, uh, and all the attachments that go with, with um, uh, farming equipment. Um, and as I mentioned, a number of them, the vast majority, in fact, have skills in, in producing secondary products such as cheeses and yogurts. Next slide, please. So there's lots of opportunity, as I mentioned. We've, we've discovered um, a lot of skills and abilities that, that seem very suited to um, working in the agriculture industry in the province. There are also challenges that we, we can't ignore, we have to address in order to make this bridge that we're trying to, to make uh, strong and effective. Some common challenges that um, refugees in particular, but, but newcomers often face when um, trying to secure work in the province are, for example, their, their language ability. So most newcomers when they arrive, or refugees I should say in this case, when they arrive to, in the province often have limited English skills. So we've identified, uh, a, in order to participate in this project, we have identified a, a minimum language level that they will need in order to be able to participate effectively. We've established a, a, a high level basic as being um, necessary to be able to receive the training and then also to be able to work effectively and safely on a farm uh, once the placements take place. Um, but we are also going to be providing, as I mentioned, the pre-employment training and that will address the farm language um, portion of the training to, um, in order to help them um, be prepared for the placement when it takes place. So uh, another um, common barrier, and I put this in quotation marks, are the um, are limited employability skills. So in this case, of course, the, the main employability skills is farming, and we've identified that that skill is a skill that they already possess. However, um, they have never farmed in Newfoundland before, so the, they understand what it takes to work the land and they understand the physical nature of the work and how to, to grow uh, food. However, um, they will need some preparation in terms of what to expect here in the Newfoundland cool climate growing. So um, we're working with Grenfell Campus. A couple of um, researchers at Grenfell are helping me to develop some uh, preparatory training in terms of um, helping them prepare for the, the Newfoundland um, growing environment. Um, but also in terms of employability skills, there are other gaps that um, this population will likely have. We, we've talked about the language, we've talked about being prepared for the cool climate um, environment. Um, there's the safety training aspect as well. So it, we will be providing safety training to ensure that um, they have the level of, of safety that would be required here in the Canadian um, workplace on the Canadian farm. Um, and the other, the other piece of the employability skills would be providing them knowledge of the, the culture of the workplace here in Canada in order to be able to work and communicate effectively in the workplace for newcomers to have an understanding of, of how, it, how what the um, cultural environment here is in Canada. 
Another employability um, or barrier to employment um, would be cultural differences. So we're tr as I mentioned, we're, we're training the newcomers to understand the Canadian cultural workplace, but there is also a, a piece to preparing the employer for the, um, the diversity uh, and the difference that comes with working with newcomers. So we will be providing training to the employers. Um, we'll be providing cultural competency um, training in order to prepare um, the other side of the divide to be able to effectively um, work with difference and identify the, um, the advantages in doing so. Um, lastly, the, another challenge, and I, it was mentioned before in, in the previous, um, one of the previous um, speakers, is access to reliable transportation. Often um, newcomers, and particularly refugees, do not have access to uh, reliable transportation. They may not have their driver's license or, or access to car. Um, and of course, in this case, when we're talking about farming, uh, farms don't typically, um, um, they don't typically exist on metro bus routes. So uh, that, that challenge is a challenge that is going to take some unique um, and collaborative uh, discussions in order to address um, if we're going to be able to make this project and future projects accessible to as many people as po possible. Next slide, please. So I've mentioned we've, we've met with the newcomers uh, to discuss and learn about their experience and learn about their uh, desire to, to work on farms in the province. We've also traveled around the province of Newfoundland and Labrador to, uh, to farms to learn about their um, challenges in terms of access to skilled labor, um, as well as their um, if they perceive any challenges and or benefits to hiring newcomers uh, to address those labor shortages. We've asked local farmers what are some important uh, qualifications or, or skills that would be required of their employees. Um, and we wanted to learn about their capacity or interest in uh, secondary processing or valued added products to see if there's a a potential for making connections uh, and developing some secondary products through this pilot project. So we've met with uh, six farms in Labrador, uh, sorry, not six in Labrador, we met with six farms in Western Newfoundland, three farms in Labrador, four farms in Central and uh, eight, sorry, 10 farms in Eastern Newfoundland so far. If you could advance, please. So talking with the farmers across the province, um, you know, we were asking them about uh, their challenge with um, access to reliable skilled labor. And for the very vast majority, they've all indicated, the vast majority certainly have indicated that it is a real problem for their operations. You can see that in 2014, 200 jobs were left or skilled, skilled positions were left vacant in the province's agriculture industry. And that equated to approximately $3 million in lost economic output. When I talked with one farmer about his, um, whether or not he's having challenges um, accessing reliable skilled labor, he indicated, well, the availability is limiting his ability. And another farmer indicated to me that all of his whole community is made up of senior citizens and that's where he's sourcing his labor. So he needs, he, he recognizes the need to do something different if he's going to be able to stay operational. Next slide, please. So keeping that in mind, the fact Sarah. that Sarah, uh, one, yes. more minute, one more minute, Sarah. Okay, thank you. So I just wanted to address to you um, the fact that you can see the farmers are using word of mouth uh, to find their their labor, 
And uh, it's not working, obviously, because the labor that they're sourcing is not addressing their, their needs. So there needs to be another way of finding the farm labor. And I'm hoping that this project is going to help them with that. Um, if you could, the next slide, please. So the skills that farmers are, have indicated they need are mechanically inclined, um, use of farm equipment, carpentry, construction, and other skills. And these are all skills we've identified in, in the newcomers that we've um, interviewed as having these skills. Um, but the one, the one ability or skill that the farmers have indicated are, is most important is a desire and a willingness to uh, work on a farm. And uh, we've identified that that's amongst the people that we've interviewed, the newcomers, they're all, they're, they all have the desire to work the land and understand the, the level of physical um, effort that's involved in doing that. The last slide, please. So just bringing it back to the beginning again, we have two sides of the divide that need to be bridged. And, and how do we bridge that? Well, we've identified the skills and the attributes by getting to know the, the newcomers. And in this case, the, the attributes, is they're the farming skills. And then we're preparing for connecting the newcomers to the farm work. And that's, we're tailoring pre-employment training programs for both the employees and the employers. And finally, we need to make that connection through the job placements where both sides of the divide are prepared to make the most of this opportunity and hoping that this project, this, um, this pilot that we're doing will help address some of the issues facing the province, such as a shortage of farm labor, such as the low participation rate of refugees in the province's workforce and the need for effective training to prepare newcomers for the workforce, but also prepare the workplace for newcomers. And finally, potentially address some knowledge gaps in the province's pro uh, production and second, uh, pr production of secondary products. So just the last slide there, please. So if you're interested in learning anything more about the project, feel free to get in touch with me. I'd be happy to share with you if you're interested in learning anything more. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sarah. So we've had four very interesting presentations. Uh, one that was uh, more, gave a, a theoretical framework for the, the kind of work that we're doing, and three that talked about specific projects that are taking place that are all very interesting, addressing a particular issue. Um, we have time for questions. We have about 15 minutes for questions. Uh, and uh, as we did before, I will circulate the wireless microphone. And uh, just raise your hand, and I will get the microphone over to you. Uh, a couple of years ago at the Harris Center, we had invited a master's student from Corner Brook to write an article about Newfoundland's culinary tradition. And she said, so she did all of her research and came back and said, well, it's essentially based on British naval eating, which is salt beef and cabbage, root vegetables, and peas pudding. And I compare that to uh, what Charles de Gaulle said. He said, it's impossible to govern a nation that has 265 different kinds of cheeses. <laughs> Talk about a different culinary culture, right? So we, we've talked to some of the panelists here today have talked about secondary processing, you know, making cheeses, making uh, beer, making sauerkraut, whatever, whatever. I think that's certainly one of the ways that we could go in this province. The other thing I find interesting about the culinary tradition is the role that celebrity chefs are having in this province. People, uh, I forget the gentleman at the Mallard Cottage, but of course, Todd Parent, who are sourcing all kinds of, of, of fu uh, fruits, vegetables, meat, et cetera, from this province, incorporating that into uh, the meals that they're making and making food in this province interesting, which is really, really good. Um, in the tourism industry where I worked for a number of years, people would ask tourists, what makes you travel? And some would say, well, I'm interested in adventure. I want to parachute off a cliff, or I want to go swimming with the sharks, or 
I want to go gambling at L Las Vegas or whatever. But one of the things that came to the very top of uh, people's choices was I travel to eat. Right. So I go to France because I love the food. I go to Italy because I love the food. I go to Thailand because I love the food. So food is a really important motivator for people who are traveling. And, and so if we improve our food services here to cater to tourists, well, that helps us as well. We eat better as well, right? Because we want them to eat better, so we eat better ourselves. Ivan. Much as I enjoy your anecdotes about food, I, um, I, I will try to ask you questions. Uh, this bring together with several of the speakers here, and you were talking about, um, Delia, about, about uh, uh, sustainable um, d different kinds of technologies. Is there a possibility to make some of those technologies, solar panels or triple glaze windows or whatever, in, in Newfoundland Labrador, using maybe some of your investors, George, that you're going to bring in, uh, and some of the immigrants that, uh, and refugees that Sarah is working with. Is there a way we can not just be training people to put uh, solar panels on there, but actually start some industry that we can use and then branch out into Atlantic Canada, where the access to these, these products is really not here at the moment? Yeah, uh, so that's one thing that I would love to see happen. Um, in terms of solar panels, China is probably the leading country for manufacturing solar panels right now. There could be a potential to kind of outsource some of that here. I'm not sure if it would make sense economically. But one thing, one area that I would love to see focused on in Newfoundland and Labrador is um, the harsh weather uh, style wind turbines and other types of renewable energy uh, components like that. I would love to see offshore wind developed in Newfoundland and Labrador basically because it would make use of our expertise in offshore conditions, harsh weather conditions. We're already a center of excellence because of our work in the oil and gas industry. People travel from all over the world to study at the Marine Institute, for instance, do ice studies, that kind of thing. And where we do have a lot of uh, port infrastructure, deep water ports, we're very well connected or well positioned, I should say, right between North America and Europe as an island to be an exporter of components like that. So I would love to see there being some sort of a manufacturing capacity for maybe large scale offshore wind turbines or, or components related to the uh, renewable energy industry. And I definitely think there is an opportunity to collaborate with uh, you know, other countries like China that already have this expertise. Um, I mentioned during my presentation that uh, as uh, uh, projects to look forward to for the next 50 years for rural Newfoundland, uh, I mentioned immigration, and uh, I think I mentioned clean energy. So during the conference, we actually introduced an experimental small wind turbine, for which is being produced in California. And uh, after the conference, as follow-up to the conference, which we're still working on, uh, we have continued to work with the uh, California company, but as I also mentioned, we brought into that conference uh, two fairly uh, significant investors. Well, actually, it's one investor, it's a father and son. And uh, we, through them, have made contact with uh, Chinese companies who have, for the last year, been working on the modification of uh, small wind turbines. And we have uh, linked into Resources Canada because Resources Canada has a lot of money for remote and rural communities. So one of our intents is to manufacture these turbines in Newfoundland and to service the rural and remo remote communities of Newfoundland and Quebec and Northwest Territories and the whole of the Arctic. I mean, that's one of our intents. And we work closely uh, at the conference. Uh, we had a company there from uh, Goose Bay called North Limited. And they have uh, an offshoot company called uh, North Power Limited, whatever. And uh, this is headed up by a longtime friend of mine who used to be a field worker for us on the Labrador coast when we, I was with the Extension Service, Ian Strachan. So Ian and I are working together on the development of that right now, and we're hoping to get some 
significant financial support from Resources Canada. Yeah. Arthur, did you want to jump in on this one? But I, I'd also like to work with this lady too, because <laughs> I, I was very, I was very <laughs> interested to see her her presentation, and I think that the two of us could work together. Oh, definitely. And she, her, she also tells me her mother or father are from uh, Fogo Island. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's meant to happen. Well, yeah, you you said. <laughs> Arthur, did you want to uh, jo join this discussion? Is Arthur still with us in Halifax? Sarah, did you want to add as well? I suppose what I could add is um, I, I see a real opportunity. Sorry, real. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, I see a real opportunity for... Um, rural Newfoundland are connecting uh, are the refugee population living here with rural Newfoundland through initiatives like like uh, like this one in, in terms of sustainable development because uh, the the population the refugee population often come from rural places themselves and in, in their home countries so in often in many cases they're very suited to living in uh, rural Newfoundland and, and have a desire to live in a rural place. So um, I often think about how do we bridge that divide, the, you know, the, the St. John's to the, um, the, the population living here in St. John's, because of course the, the refugees that live in Newfoundland for the most part are here in St. John's. Um, how do we bridge that divide to rural Newfoundland? Um, you know, the, they don't know what's beyond that overpass. And I, th I think there's a, an opportunity to market rural Newfoundland to, um, to newcomers because, uh, you know, it, it is a desirable place for, uh, for many people. Uh, they just oftentimes don't realize what it has to offer. Mm -hmm. So it is an opportunity. Good point. Could Arthur, I, are you there? Could I have a oh. quick Yes, uh, sorry, my mic was... Uh, no, sorry, go My ahead. mic... My mic was on mute. Uh -huh. um, I really find this uh, discussion very interesting. Um, also, from some knowledge that I have about the developing countries, I know that uh, there is a lot of investment taking place in, in solar energy in rural areas uh, because of the, the electricity problems and the higher power rates. So. I think um, those coming from rural areas in developing countries um, could bring in that knowledge uh, uh, to to introduce that technology um, in rural Newfoundland. Um, but uh, also, I would like to see if there is uh, any evidence uh, suggesting how immigration affects the environmental environmental technology. That's I haven't seen yet. You make a good point because we, we, we think that we are the sources of innovation here in this province, but uh, there, there might be people from coming yeah. in from outside with new ideas about, uh, I don't know, pest control or, or whatever that they use in their yes. countries that we could apply here. Yeah, that's the benefit of diversity, you know. Uh, George, do you want to add something? Yeah, I, I think uh, one of the answers to that question is very simple, and it's ask the people in rural Newfoundland. Ask the people in rural Newfoundland and learn how to listen to what they say because they are the fountain of knowledge and the fountain of truth when it comes to attracting people and talking to people and marketing rural Newfoundland. I mean, I worked with the Extension Service for 20 years. And during the 60s and 70s, we went around to communities and tried to start development. The key thing that we did was leadership training at the community level. And we would go into those communities and we would do conferences, but we would do workshops. I mean, I remember living on Fogo Island for five or six weeks out of a trailer, running workshops with the people to teach them the principles of cooperatives back in the 60s. 
But the key thing is this last thing I said. Not just offering the leadership training with information, but learn how to listen to what they say. Okay, now I won't go into my whole philosophy about deep listening, but I mean, in our case, with the extension service at that time, we had 20 field workers around the province, okay? We had a public television program. We had a research magazine to fishermen, okay? We had artists in residence. We had courses and conferences. We had visual and performing arts. We used to run the art galleries and so on and so forth. So all of this we integrated creatively to start the rural development movement. And the rural development movement created the revolution in this province from 1964 to 74. We had a revolution, okay? I call it a, a renaissance rather than a revolution. And we started this, we achieved this by deeply, deeply, deeply reaching down to the heart of the community and listening to ordinary Newfoundlanders tell their stories. And first of all, you know, the first day in the community, they won't do anything other than bitch and growl and fight and so on and so forth. But one of the key things we always taught our field workers to do and what we did from St. John's was don't go in, do the workshop, close the door and, and go home. Stay the next day, stay the next two days and go around and talk to the community and get the real feedback. And that's what I call deep listening. And because of that, we got brilliant ideas. I mean, I used to come back to St. John's and I'm from, I, I was gonna say I'm from rural Newfoundland, I'm from Petty Harbor, that's, that's more close to St. John's. But basically I grew up at a time in Petty Harbor when we could only come out to St. John's once a year to buy our long underwear in September if my father made enough fish, like money fishing, right? So when I, and I was teaching, I was principal of Labrador City Collegiate when I came to work with the extension service. And the very first thing Dan Snowden, who was a brilliant, brilliant man, who was my director, the very first thing he said to me, he said, I want you to go over in the education building and stay there for two weeks. And I said, you know, you're gonna pay me for that? He said, just do it, okay? And when I went, I saw for the first time the Fogo film. The Fogo film was being shown to members of government and ministers of government, and they were coming in, John Nolan, some of you might remember the, these names, they were coming in and watching them, and we were having follow-up and so on and so forth. My role was to stay there and shut up and listen. Okay, I cried, I did everything when I said, when I listened to the to fishermen, when I listened to Newfoundlanders talking on film. I mean, it, it was just incredible, uh, absolutely incredible. And as I worked for 20 years, traveling around Lu Newfoundland and Labrador, and every time I came back to St. John's, it, I, I used to get drunk, absolutely drunk with excitement as to how much I would learn <laughs> in rural Newfoundland. So let's ask the people and let's try to listen to them, I period. George, my, my sense is that the low-hanging fruit of listening has been picked. Yeah. We need to do even deeper listening now because we need to listen to the vulnerable people, the people who don't have a voice, right? It's, we still need to do that deep listening, maybe even deeper at, at this stage. We can do it much more effectively, much, much more effectively. Right. We've only got time for one more question. I'll give it to Tony. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, I enjoyed all the four presentations. They are complimentary. And uh, on one hand, I think as Ekberry, you have uh, demonstrated that you know, in Atlantic province, we do have the issue of skill labor shortages and uh, aging population, of migration, so on and so forth. Uh, so we need to do something about it. And uh, uh, the other hand, we also have challenges in sustainable development, rural development, and so on and so forth. The idea of this conference is that it possibly could actually, you know, take advantage of, you know, this uh, skilled migration program, uh, refugee program, temporary foreign workers, and so on and so forth, so we can solve some of the issues. 
that we are facing, right? And uh, your example, you know, George and uh, your internship program and Sarah's uh, agriculture project by the refu certain refugees and uh, also Danielle, uh, you, you mentioned that, you know, renewable energy. Actually, we can actually not only have an abundant supply of resources in oil, gas, you know, in mining, uh, you know, very supportive government, you know, very friendly community and high sense of belonging and so on and so forth, but also we can potentially harvest, you know, harsh weather, okay, yeah, <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. by uh, wind farms. I mean, this, this is what I call in the air innovation, we have product innovation, process innovation, but also we have social innovation, right? I think this is probably we can call social innovation, you know, policy innovation, right? We can address those big issues, long-term uh, challenges we're facing. The next 10 years in this province is going to be another revolution. There's going to be another revolution of thinking and change. And how we handle that and how we manage it is, is up to us because the government can't do it alone. You have to have some involvement with people. But just cutting to the chase with the Association of New Canadians, what I'm really encouraged about is the recent opening of regional offices across the province because the Association for New Canadians does an absolutely fantastic job. They're one of the uh, groups involved in all of this that I highly, highly respect. And for now, now that they have regional offices, I would suggest to ANC considering some kind of an outreach to the communities from those regional offices to offer leadership training. And the other thing I would suggest uh, that we have a meeting to, s to compare what Sarah, Sarah is doing in agriculture with what we're trying to do in conjunction with the Marine Institute in fisheries because there are a lot of things there that we can work together on. I'm really pleased to hear her presentation. The person I'm going to be working with at the Marine <laughs> Institute is this gentleman right here, uh, Ed, uh, from, from uh, the Marine Institute. Just, just to tell people your name, full name, and what your role is, Ed. Uh, Ed was uh, the head of school fisheries at Fisheries. Right. He did something about fisheries, coastal fisheries, uh, coastal fisheries in Africa. Yeah. yeah. So you're a Merc man, Ed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'd like to thank our four panelists very much for them taking the time to prepare and present their wonderful presentations. Please, a round of applause to all our panelists.